Jordan, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm totally excited to be here. Super excited to have you here. I know we're going to have a great conversation today. Jordan, as I said up top, he is an author. He is a medical doctor. He is deep in terms of his thinking and a, another brother of vulnerability is what I'm calling <laughs> some of the men that I'm, I'm speaking to uh, in this season of the podcast. But before we get into the bulk of today's conversation, tell the mental wealth family what mental wealth means to you. Mental wealth means to me living a life comfortably in a sense of purpose. In other words, this idea that I know what lights me up and I can find that abundantly in my life and pursue it for whatever amount of time I have left. That to me feels like a lot of people aren't walking around with mental wealth then because I feel like a lot of us don't figure that out sometimes until it's much later in life and maybe we'll we'll talk about that. So how did you come to that conclusion for self? You may not have thought of it in mental wealth terms specifically. You might think of that as happiness, fulfillment, but how did you get there with being being so clear on that? It took me a long time to try to figure out this idea of purpose. And I realized I had been sleepwalking through a lot of my life. When my father died and I was seven, he was a doctor. So I'm like, that's my purpose. I'm going to be a doctor, which really served me for a certain amount of time. But as I got farther and farther along and started burning out medicine, I realized that that sense of purpose, that thing I thought was my identity, wasn't. And so that started a really deep time of reflection. And I started to think, well, how do I get to be the person who I want to be? And the easiest thing, I mean, the easiest thing to think about was wealth, money, right? The, the way I don't like to define, to define wealth is the first thing I thought is money is if I can just make enough money, I can stop being a doctor, which isn't serving me anymore. And I almost substituted that for purpose for a while. But then I got there and I was like, okay, I've gotten really good as a doctor at accumulating wealth and investing and doing all these things. But the problem is I'm not any happier. I have no sense of my purpose anymore. I just know that I can check off the checkbox that I have enough money to support me and I can pull back from work. But that didn't really fulfill me. It, it only solved money problems and lots of life problems are non-money problems. And so that started a time of really deep reflection where I started to think about who do I want to be, what's important to me, and when do I feel most alive? And as I pulled away from medicine and started building these other things up in my life, whether that was writing or podcasting or public speaking, I started realizing that I loved to communicate with people. I loved to have deep conversations about important things. And the more I did that in life, the more it lit me up and the happier I was. And so the bell in my head went off and said, oh, that's purpose. And I feel wealthy when I'm spending more of my time doing that than other things which I don't like doing. And that was like the moment when I said, okay, this is how I can spend my life. This is what living a life looks like. And when did you start to have that realization? Is that around a particular age, around a particular event? Because we all get there at different times. So I've been having this realization since I was a little kid and started writing poetry in middle and, and high school. The problem was I did my best not to listen to those little voices that were telling me who I was because the idea of that was scary, right? When I was in high school or college to say, okay, who you are as a communicator, you want to write. And at that time there wasn't podcasting. So maybe it would have been a radio personality or news person or these kind of things that really would engage me. To do that, I would have to come to the conclusion that I didn't want to be a doctor, which is what my father was, which was this little connection I had to him after he died when I was seven and I didn't have him in my life anymore. And then I had to also think about things like, hey, I've been figuring I'm going to be a doctor and you're going to make a lot of money and do great doing that. But if I say I want to be a creator, a communicator, God knows how I'm going to make money doing that. So I had these voices telling me that this was part of my true identity, my true self. But it was really easy to push those off because of outside concerns. You know, society expected me to be a doctor. That's what I told my whole family. Everyone thought I was going to do it. Everyone told me that being a doctor was a profession. But, you know, having these conversations, that's not a profession. That's, that's a hobby. So there were many things driving me. As I get older, also, I realized that seeing my father died, I think I was petrified of my own life expectancy and death, too. And as opposed to thinking about those things that are really important to me, right? What do I need to do that's most important? It's like saying life is finite and you only live once. So you better start thinking about these things now 
because you never know when you're going to disappear one day the way my father did. I didn't want to think about that. It was so much easier to put it off and just take this path that had been prescribed for me. It was less stressful. It was easier. I didn't have to do the deep work. And so I stayed on that same path, but my true sense of purpose and identity kept creeping out. Like when I started medicine, I also started writing a blog about medicine and I would sneak away in the middle of the night when everyone else was sleeping or during my half an hour lunch break because I was so busy being a doctor all the other time. I'd sneak away and write these really quick blog posts. I didn't even have time to edit them, right? So I put out these blog posts that had all sorts of grammatical errors because I had just little bits of time to fit it in. And I realized that I was shortchanging myself on the th one thing that I really connected with because I was afraid. I didn't have the courage to explore it at that time. Wow. Being able to, even being able to admit that you didn't have the courage, even the way that you're able to reflect on this tells me that you've done some of the work. I mean, we've all got work that we can still do. I believe that work is a lifelong process. You probably uh, uh, agree on that too. I was curious, was there a, a feeling of even being a doctor, like this is what dad would have wanted? Or was it more so kind of like you said that you saw that and it brought to mind more about your mortality? Because some people it's like, ah, I got to do this because this is what my parent would have wanted. This is what somebody would have wanted. So for me, it goes even a little deeper. My dad died when I was seven. And if you remember being that age, you know, you're pretty self-centered at that age. And somewhere deep down inside, I think I felt like my dad's death was my fault. And it was something I think I really struggled with more on a subconscious level than a conscious level. And I think somewhere deep down, I decided if I could step into his shoes, if I could carry on the good work he was doing when he died prematurely, that would then make sense of this situation. That would make me good. I would be enough then, right? I wouldn't be responsible if I could step in and make up for this horrible thing I did, which of course I didn't do. My dad died of a brain aneurysm accidentally. Like it just happened one day. But I think all of that was somewhere deep down inside me. And that really held me to this idea of staying in the medical profession for quite a while. I had to get to this point where I realized that my father's dying wasn't a failing of mine and that I had to develop a sense of enough outside of all these external factors. And part of that feeling enough was actually doing things that, you know, spoke to my soul and for better, for worse, I loved being a doctor in many ways. I'm really glad I did it. I feel like I was able to affect the world and there were parts of it that I really loved. Um, but in the end, it wasn't speaking to my soul the way some of these other things were that I that I just kept putting off. And would you say that you've done some healing so far at this point? Because that's going to set up the next question. Would you feel, do you feel like you've just done some healing in terms of what you're describing? Yeah, I mean, I, I, it, it's been a continuous process. And I don't know if I'll ever stop per se healing. I mean, you know, it creeps up in little ways that you don't expect all the time. And you, you know, you start thinking about things and you struggle and sometimes you struggle for days or weeks. Sometimes so that's my follow-up. So, so, so that's what I was going to ask about. Like, what does that, what does it look like for you? Because things still come up for me too. And so I was curious what some of the things that you've done, whether it's therapy, whether it's just self-reflection journaling, not just, but also self-reflection journaling. And then when you do have these thoughts or things come up, how do you, I don't want to say fight them off, but how do you kind of put them back in their, in their place? So the way I've always worked through these things is mostly writing. And in fact, one of the most difficult times for me emotionally was when I realized that I had enough money not to be a doctor anymore and yet could logically walk my way through the numbers, but couldn't necessarily separate this identity that I had built for so long so I started writing, and in fact, I wrote a blog called Diversify, and I wrote literally a blog post every day for almost a full year out there in the world, almost like an accountability journal. It was whatever came to my mind that day about my journey and where I was. So I found that in times where have been most difficult for me, I get the most out of writing. And so that's usually what I turn to to deal with kind of – those unresolved issues. And I find that over time they creep out and I start getting a much better understanding of, of what I'm feeling. Cause as you and I both know, a lot of times what we're feeling isn't always right there up in the center of our mind. It's hiding somewhere deep down and it takes some real work to kind of bring it up and start working through, okay, this is why I actually feel this way. Um, 
And once you get a hold of that, that doesn't mean it fixes it. That's another thing I learned is just knowing better doesn't mean doing better in the end, right. uh, but it's the first step, right? Is you got to understand why it's there. And then you can say, okay, well, what can I now do to make that better? Yeah. I love with journaling one, you can also, you can read back and, and see how you've evolved over time. But then two, you do get to, or closer to the root of what's actually going on. Because I found that a lot of times what we think is the issue, and we probably had this conversation before, like what we think is the issue or what we think we're upset about. Sometimes even that first emotion is not the actual emotion, like that anger, oh, that anger is actually hurt. That anger is actually sadness, you know? And what I found is that um, through the process of writing, and for me, my writing is always kind of very deep and full of storytelling. But so what healing looks like to me is a retelling and often a reinterpretation of those things that happened to me in order to see them as magical or necessary or part of the process, as opposed to look at them and mourn the past or what I couldn't have changed. And so in the process of writing and storytelling, what I'm doing is I'm revising my understanding of those things I went through, sometimes difficult to the point where Instead of difficult, they start looking and feeling heroic. And so to me, writing is part of that imprinting process, which helps you retell the stories of your life in a different way. And I'm not saying in an untruthful way, um, but to interpret them in a more heroic and less victimized way. And so for me, writing has always been part of that imprinting. Love that you said less victimized way, because that's a really important part of the healing process. And just this idea of writing in general, I started on my first book, my first manuscript. I'm writing that right now. And what I've just learned from this experience is the way that I'm retelling some of these stories and trying to tell them like objectively, I'm also realizing like, wow, that was not the greatest situation for a child to be in. Or wow, I really took the blame for that. And that thing had nothing to do with me or wow, these other things were going on well before I even existed. So there's nothing that I could have done. To stop. I mean, this stuff was was in motion like years before I even existed. So I found writing to be cathartic in uh, that way. And I, I assume that may have played a factor, even though I know the, the, the book is kind of tied to uh, some of the lessons that, that you've learned through your profession and also what what you've learned and practiced through the personal finance world. I'd imagine taking stock was probably the uh, actually no, I'm, I won't assume for you. Was it a cathartic process to write that book or was it? more of a challenge, even though it wasn't just solely about your life. What was that experience like for you? So it was, it was a very cathartic process. Just to speak to one of the things you mentioned, you know, you spoke about your trials and tribulations in writing your book. And I spoke about my father, but key to both of those stories is this sense of self-forgiveness. And I think this idea of forgiving yourself for your past, often the past that you couldn't have controlled and that you're not responsible for, but you start kind of with self-forgiveness and then you forgive the other people around you in your life who played a role in those things too. But I think that's a big part of the writing process. So back to this question of, of whether taking stock was cathartic, you know, it really, really was because I started writing about medicine in 2004, 2005. I talked, you know, I wrote a blog called in my humble opinion, it was a blog about what it felt like to be a doctor and practice medicine. It was the stories behind medicine. But what it ended up being and also relating is my path through burnout eventually led me to personal finance and writing about personal finance in a podcast and then connecting the dots through my hospice patients about money and life and what's truly important is it formed an arc in my story. And so writing, taking stock in a, in a, in a way was like my summative argument. I think about, you know, I did medical malpractice work. So, you know, I've been in juries and trials and I've watched how lawyers work. And at the end of the trial, right, they give their closing argument. So taking stock was like the closing argument on my professional life and my emotional life surrounding this idea of building wealth and, and a life of purpose. And so it was very cathartic because I felt like I could use the book to close that arc, uh, to tell my story in its completeness. And one of the sad things about that, actually, is, you know, I'd like to be a repeat author, 
But after you give your closing statement, it's really hard to go back and then say, okay, I want to write something else about finance. Because in a lot of ways, maybe I'll evolve and change over the next bunch of years. But in many ways, I feel like this was somewhat my closing argument. I don't think about money much anymore as money or, or what it can do for me. I much more now, even on my own podcast, talk about it as a concept and what living a good life really looks like. Um, so yes, to answer your question, it was very cathartic. And you also pointed out that we moved through seasons. You didn't say this specifically, but you talk about writing about money. And this is how I feel about some of the past lanes that I've been in, where I got to a point where it's like, yeah, I still love this thing, but it's not the primary thing that I'm thinking about anymore. And the most authentic thing that I can do is to talk about what I'm actually feeling now and what I'm thinking about for the future, as opposed to just doing what I've always done, because that's what's worked. So I wanted, I wanted to call that out specifically because I think it, it is like a key thing to be able to say, you know what, like this, and you, you said earlier, like about something not serving you. And, and this isn't to say, by the way, that talking about money doesn't serve you. That's not what I'm saying at all. It's just that where you're focused, the things that you're thinking about, how do I live a healthier life? <laughs> that type of thing. How do I, how am I here for those moments that matter? And uh, I'd imagine even for you, just given that you did also, I didn't know if, at first, it, you, so much of your work was like hospice based a, as a doctor. I knew you were a doctor for a while, but I, it took me a little while to realize that I was like, oh, he's talking to a lot of people who are in a very I don't difficult spot or who are in a they're in a spot that we'll all get to someday. It just matters. It's just it's just a matter of whether it's like sooner rather than later. So how I mean, that is the basis <laughs> of the book in some ways. But I'm also curious how that how how deeply and how fundamentally it impacted the way that you thought about like what wealth meant in your own life as you were as you were talking to these folks who were at the end of their own i mean it it had affected me very deeply and you know have you ever been stuck with a decision and you weren't sure how to make it right should i buy this or shouldn't i buy this should i do this thing or shouldn't i do this thing and then all of a sudden the decision is gone because someone else bought it or it disappears and you're like oh man i should have done it the problem is a lot of times we don't know what we're going to think until the options are gone. And so that's like the amazing thing that hospice taught me is like, it's really hard to say without doing some real visualization and really thinking deeply about it. It's hard to say what's important or not important to us until the likelihood of achieving those things all of a sudden is pulled out from under you. So this is what happens with hospice patients is they're told, oh, you're doing okay, or at least thinking you had longer. And now I'm going to tell you of six months or less, you know, it really makes you think deeply about what didn't I do? What do I regret? What are those things that were important to me? And they do so in a way that's so different from the rest of us because their number of tomorrows are obviously and severely limited. And until you or I are in that situation, it's really hard to understand that unless we push ourselves, right? Unless we become really mindful and make that part of our practice. So it, it profoundly affected me to see people who had the option taken away and then to listen to what they complained about, worried about, rejoiced in. Like, And you never, you never hear them say, I wish I worked harder at my job. You never hear them say, I wish my net worth was a little bit higher. Often what they really end up talking about is that thing that they really wanted to do, but never had the courage to do it, or that relationship that was so important, but it got away from them and they never rejuvenated it. Or when it comes to things, it's usually a thing that has meaning. So it's never like, I, I really wish I bought that Porsche. It was, I was a lover of cars forever. And that lover of car, being a lover of cars was something I spent such a significant amount of my time doing. So I wish I had spent the money to buy something that was important to me because it added so much value to my life. But it's never really about the thing. It's about what the thing was a symbol of. And so that I got to see all these things up front and play out in real time. And I, I mean, how could that not impact the way I think about the world today? I mean, I used to I used to tell people like YOLO, you only live once. What a horrible concept, right? This idea that, oh, you only live once, so you better spend your money now. And I, I would argue and argue, well, you live many times, and if you spend all your money now, it won't be there for when you get married or you have kids or you have grandkids. I was thinking about all these other lives that you have and how horrible this idea of YOLO was. And then I started looking at my dying patients, and I'm like, 
yeah, but they don't all have that much time anymore. And maybe for them, it does make some sense to spend a little more liberally. And maybe there are times or seasons in our life where spending liberally is totally okay. I would have never even thought about that or understood it deep in my soul the way I did once I started taking care of dying patients. Man, the the money not being a thing. I, that people, were, I, I'd imagine... If I were in that, I probably wouldn't be like, damn, man, I wish I had paid off that debt. <laughs> or like, I wish. <laughs> well, I'd imagine people may think of that in the sense of like, let's say that they have debt that they're leaving on to their family members because they didn't get to take care of it. And that gets passed on. That's that's one thing. But when you're there is something about being forced to make choices on a deadline, like just uh, I hate to say deadline. We're talking about people. Dying, but I mean, that's <laughs> essentially like like what it is being forced to make choices. It, it does force you to, to evaluate like, OK, what's what's really important? Like, what do I what can I do? What do I need to do? What will bring me the most fulfillment right now in this time that I have left? Like, how do I want to leave things with yeah. these people? Like you, it's stuff that you just take for granted, because even just like something as simple for me is like calling home. Like my mom is getting older and I know that like I don't have infinite years with her left. And so for me, there's like a I need to make sure that like, you know, I'm I'm at least checking in periodically and having a conversation because I saw how this went with one parent who's no longer here. And I don't want to have that experience with this second parent. I want to take advantage of this opportunity that I do have left. This is a theme here, right? We tend to shy away from things that are really, really hard because they're emotional and they're time consuming. And unlike our, you know, priorities in the workplace or even our financial priorities, those things are really well defined. But the problem with thinking about spending that time with a loved one or even working towards that goal that has been so important in your life is it's usually more ephemeral. Like we don't have as many defined endpoints. Like what is enough time with your mom before God forbid something happens to her? I don't know. Like, how do we define that? So those type of conversations are deep and difficult and vulnerable. And it's so much easier to just focus on something else. It's so much easier to say, I got to call mom, but I'm really looking to get that raise. And if I just put that extra hour in at work, it's going to do the thing. So what do you do? You go back to work and you don't call mom, right? Because it's measurable. It's easier. It's less vulnerable. That's happened before. Yeah. That's, ha that's, that's it, whether it's work or, something for the podcast or whatever it is, something for track. Like it's it, that, like, that's a very real thing where it happens. It was like, Oh, well I do this. It'll take an hour. This is going to add to this thing. And, and I think what gets us in trouble is even though we know that there's finite time, we still say I can do that later. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why I love your story actually, because in a sense you've done the exact opposite. Like you, I can tell, right? Track for you had a sense of purpose and a sense of connection, and you probably put it off for a long time. But something clicked in your brain that said, okay, maybe that's something I have to pursue now. Maybe even pursuing that might mean that I'm a less aggressive at work, or I'm less aggressive in my podcast, or I'm less aggressive in all these things that I've built up as the most important things. But something in you caused you to make that change. For me, it was taking care of dying people and seeing that they didn't have the time. Like if you waited till you were 70 or 80 and then were given a terminal diagnosis, you couldn't go back and say, I really wish that I had pursued track back, you know, all those days, all those years ago. Or I had a patient named Ernesto who tried to climb Mount Everest and failed in his 20s, but then he started dying in his 40s of leukemia. If he had waited, right? If he had said, oh my God, I'm in the middle of my big money-making years. I'm moving up the corporate ladder. I can't afford to take the year off to train and then go try to climb Mount Everest. If that had been his answer, he would have never done it. And then he would have been lying on his deathbed in his 40s saying, I wish I had the courage to do this thing that was important to me. But instead, he was lying on his deathbed, regaling us with stories of being up on the mountain. And by the way, he never made it to the top. The weather changed. They never made it. He had to go back. It wasn't whether he succeeded or failed. It was that he had the courage to try. And so I think we need to bring that into our lives way earlier. We can't wait till we're 70 or 80. We can't wait till we begin a terminal diagnosis. That doesn't mean being frivolous. That doesn't mean not managing your finances. What it actually means is managing your finances in such a way that it supports you in doing those really important things, as opposed to giving up those really important things to build your finances. 
Right. And you give money as one example, but time is another thing. And I want to talk about the time perception <laughs> arbitrage a little bit after this. But you reminded me, and I, I said this on a recent episode of the podcast, where I took time off from podcasting, basically, because there I was doing track. And at that point in time, I was like, you know what? I really want to focus on this. Yeah. I don't know. Even though it was my first year back, I was like, I don't know how long I'm going to be able to do this. I haven't done this in over 15 years. I know that I have a goal for this season. And I think I realized in support of what you said, like it wasn't about like winning a national championship. For me, it was about doing something I never thought I'd do again. Yeah, you had to and, be in the arena, yeah. right? And so my wish for you is that one day in your 80s, 90s, 100s, whatever it is, when you're lying on your deathbed, you're going to be telling your hospice caregivers about what it felt like to walk out onto the field for your track meet. And if that's the case, then that time was so well spent because when we start thinking about investments outside of the world of money and start thinking about them in terms of purpose and identity and experiences, the investment you're doing in yourself right now will pay dividends for the rest of your life and will compound just like money does. Except the difference is compounded money doesn't really in the end bring you happiness. You just use it as a tool. But compounding your dreams and your experiences and your goals, that does. That pays off, man. That pays off for the rest of your life. It really does. And I'm thinking about part of – it was a realization I had at a track meet, seeing somebody – there's this gentleman. He's probably about 70 years old. He's been in magazine. Like He's like the master's track athlete like dude. And I can say I haven't looked up to there's people I look up to, but I, I can honestly say like there aren't like a whole lot of men that I'm like, I really look up to this person or like I really admire this. That's that's just that's just the way it's been. But this guy, it was different because he was 70 years old and I'd seen like an older picture of him somewhere. And I had this thought for the first time. It's like, man, I want I know what life was like for me as a child growing up, like what my dad was doing like as he got older. And I would love for my children to be able to see me like running track at like 70 years old to see me still out there like just the, the met like what seeing that person and yeah. i don't know that guy at all i've only seen him at a couple of meets but like i actually shed tears like thinking about it i was like that's like that's it's not about the medals it's like this i want even if it's a few years from now like being able to bring kids to attract me and it's, it's like like that's like meaningful to me and it's not just about me it's about like the impression and what's that's gonna what that's gonna teach them you know why because what you witnessed is someone with what you would call mental wealth. You witnessed someone living their purpose and seeing that as seeing that for people like us who are in the midst of the struggle of trying to figure out what that is. It's beautiful, right? It's beautiful to see someone living their purpose. And um, that's why, I mean, it affects you. It, it affects you down to your core because that's kind of what we want. Yeah. And even seeing, there's that guy, but going to, there was also something, and maybe this relates to the time aspect. There's also something about seeing, going to these meets and seeing men who are 60, 70, 80 years old out there still doing it yeah. and doing it at a high level. Like I never thought I would see like a 70 year old running faster <laughs> than me, but I, 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 I saw that <laughs> happen. So it even seeing that gave me a different perception on time. Cause we were talking beforehand about like how I'm fighting this as, as I march toward 40, literally and figuratively, uh, how, I'm starting to feel this like time is running out and people, people say like, Oh, well you take care of yourself. So life expectancy, I know for an average black man, it's this, but it's going to be long. But I'm like, yeah, but even if like my life isn't halfway over, it still feels like it's like 45% over. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel like I'm, I'm running out of time and my perception of time is kind of warped. So I want to talk a bit about the time perception arbitrage, what that means what that's meant in terms of the, the folks that you've worked with and yeah, just kind of go from there. So take us down the time perception arbitrage pathway and, and how you think about that. So the thing about it is we really mistake this concept of time. A lot of times we try to commoditize it, right? You can, we talk about buying time or using time or wasting time, but the truth of the matter is time marches on no matter what you do. It's a constant and we have zero control over it. So, in my opinion, there's only really two things you can do. You can 
change what takes place during that time, right? So I look at our lives as these series of time periods, you know, call them days, call them weeks, call them, call them months, whatever you want to call them, call them years. Those time periods pass no matter what. All you have is control over what you're doing during those time periods, right? So the idea is that we want to fill up those time periods as much as we can with things we like doing and get rid of those things that cause friction in our lives. And that's by being very thoughtful and trying to work on things like purpose and building that more into your life and getting rid of less of the getting rid of those things you don't like. So that's one possibility is just controlling what you put in those time spaces that we have. The only other thing is, is our perception of time. And we all know this, like time feels differently at different times of your life. When you are a little kid and you're in the middle of the school year and it's winter, I mean, those days are like months, right? Yes. And yet when you're in your fifties and sixties and your kids are growing up and going off to college, it feels like those days just fly by when you're doing something you like time passes like that. When you go and get down into the plank position and someone says, all right, I'll let you know when three minutes has passed. Oh, time goes slower than you can imagine. So, you know, what can we do? We can control what things we put in our time slots, and then we can try to work on our perception. And so for me, working on my perception has been to get rid of as many things I don't like doing as possible and create the free time and margin, the space to start doing things I like to do. And so for me, at the age of 50, time feels really abundant. Like I have all sorts of things to do over the next week, but you know what? I chose every single one of them. I could cancel any one of them at any time. Like I've been putting out a podcast two times a week for the last four years. If I want to put it out one time a week this week or not put it out at all or not edit or whatever decision I want to make, I have a hundred percent complete control over what my next week, month, and year look like. And so to me, that really creates the perception of a huge amount of abundance to the time of time. In fact, I kind of feel like nowadays I have enough time to do anything. All I have to do is stay up an extra hour if I really want to. Um, so I'm finding myself at the age of 50, yes, realizing that time does fly. And certainly I went from 40 to 50 incredibly quickly, right? So I, I get that concept. But on the other hand, from day to day, I feel like there's so much time in the world to do whatever I want. And part of the reason why is I just got rid of all the things I dreaded and replaced them with things I could control. I wonder if that's part of, I was thinking about, like, this is going to sound like a weird parallel or side tangent, but I was thinking about like how... Like we get older, at least me, like I care less about fashion. I remember like in my twenties, it was like, I got to have the, the jeans and the air forces and this, and now I primarily wear sweatpants. <laughs> like it's, it's just something that I just, I just don't care as I just don't, I care about my appearance, like phys like physically, like how I looked, but I don't put as much effort into that. I find even in terms of like the way that I speak, I don't feel as restricted anymore in terms of like what I can say, not say, even at work, you know, there's been a lot of layoffs in tech lately. And my view is still, if I feel like I can't be myself here, then, or then I will leave. I have that choice to leave. And I, and I think about this because just one thing I have gathered from folks uh, getting older is, is this, there is more control, which is it's it, at least a, a perceived feeling of control and a, and a perceived and maybe part of that is acceptance of self, acceptance of identity, acceptance of doing, knowing that you're going to do what you want. What's that been for you? What's that acceptance been for you as as you've as you moved up to and or around fifty? So one of the amazing things about working with the dying is you really start asking yourself the question: If I were to die tomorrow, what haven't I done? What goals have I and I fulfilled? Who are the people I haven't reconnected with? You start really going through this list of what would I regret? So I've got to a point of acceptance where I realized that most of what I think I needed to accomplish in the world, I did, right? I was a doctor for 15, 20 years and still practice hospice medicine and know that in my workplace, I made a real change and had a real effect on people's lives. You know, I brought up two kids who I think are going to be fine regardless of anything happens to me. I've been in love and got married. I wrote a book, which was a huge goal of mine. I've made good friends. I mean, I, I can't really look at my life and say, so yes, would I like to be a New York Times bestseller? Yes. Would I like 
someone to pay me a million dollars to buy my podcast. I mean, you can, you can name all these things, but you start realizing that those things are all kind of external and I have no control over those. Like I can control practicing being a good podcaster. I can develop my interview techniques. I can build a situation in which every time I get on the mic, I have a blast, right? So I can work on those things and those things I can improve. The other stuff is just so external and ultimately, A, I can't control it, so why even bother? I can do little things, but most of that's uncontrollable. And B, I've also realized that often when you get to these big goals that you think are what's going to make you happy, you're already on to, well, what's the next thing fairly quickly? And you start realizing that big goals don't make you happy anymore, but it's actually being in the process of doing something purposeful that feels good while you're doing it that actually sustains you. It's not the big goal. It's, it's not getting a million people to listen to my podcast. It's being in the midst of having an amazing conversation and loving it and thinking, God, I can't wait till I publish this. Ah, being present, yeah. being in the moment is what I'm hearing from you. How does that land? Yeah, I mean, it does. And, and I don't want to say that we shouldn't have big goals. I mean, I've had plenty of big goals in my life, but I've definitely also moved away from the externalities of those big goals and started more working on the things on the inside I can change um, and starting to look much more at process versus product, right? So, and, and uh, this is a very privileged place, right? I worked as a doctor. I made a lot of money. I invested it. So this has given me some freedom, freedom. Sometimes I wish I had at a younger age before I was doing so well, but so I really think a lot about process versus product because again, products are uncontrollable. Our, our endpoint often is, ends up somewhere we don't think it will, but we do have some control over what it feels like to be in the process and and how we fill our time. You know, you also there, there's so much, <laughs> and I I love where you're going with it because I'm like, oh, idea, idea, idea. Probably not going to get to all this today, but I, I did want to call out that a couple of minutes ago, as you were going through your life, I was like, wow, he's literally taking stock right now. Yeah. <laughs> Like being able to sit and say, like, I've done this, I've done this, I've done that is it's powerful. It's just powerful to hear that. Like the, like even the, the level of calmness, like I can see you and, I, and just like the level of calmness with which you said it. Whereas I think for self, I'm still a little, like even recalling, I think I still have a little bit of that. I have more to go, you know, that like that, and like, I, I can admit that that like next thing feeling is there, but you're kind of like, I did that. And I think I do feel that way having won a national championship where like I've already yeah. won, like I've won a championship. Now this season is more about fun. And so I'm not even pressuring about the meat. I don't have the pressure that I had last year because I'm like, I did the part that I did way more than I thought I would do. So I'm going to have fun and enjoy this now. But, and, and this is really, really the point, right? People ask me, how do I have a good death, right? It's something people are really afraid of, right? They're afraid of the symptoms, et cetera. And oftentimes I say, well, we kind of die like we live. So the best way to have a good death is to have a good life, right? Well, so then how do you have a good life? Well, you start asking yourself these questions when you're 40 and 50 and you don't wait till you're 70 or 80 to do it. And so feeling a little bit unsettled or looking at your life today and saying, okay, I've accomplished these things, but there's still a few things there. It's actually a fantastic opportunity to say, okay, these are the things I want to start thinking about now because I don't know how many tomorrows I have. And I don't want to one day look back and have to struggle in my last few weeks or months to find some rev resolution to these things. Why not do it now? Why not do it when you're 20 or 30 or 40 or 50? Why do it when you have the pressure of terminal illness on your mind? Why not do it? in the midst of our lives? And the answers are because most of us are too scared to actually put our mind to this, but you are already putting your mind to this. And my goal is to get more people to do that. I love that. And so what do you think? The, the, so you said people are scared, afraid of what? I think ultimately we're afraid of dying. And the reason why that is important is because doing important big things in our life makes us realize that life is finite. And we don't like thinking about how finite life is. So we tend to put the big things off because it scares us. Because what you're really saying is, I, Jordan Grummet, recognize that I will die one day and this thing's important to me, so I better start thinking about it. That's a really uncomfortable thing to do. It's much easier to say, eh, it's somewhere far off. I don't want to think about this big, deep, important, difficult stuff. It gives me anxiety. What if I don't get there? What if I get there and die? What if I don't live long enough? All these kind of horrible things you don't want to think about. So just put it off. 
the fear thing is is very real in putting it in kicking it down the road not having to think about the uncomfortable thoughts but that fear also gets us in trouble because it's that same fear that stops us from doing the deep internal work most definitely there's no question about it and um if you want to get your life together at any time, you've got to do, do the deep internal work. And let me promise you, if you don't want to do it now, you will do it when you're given a terminal diagnosis. Not everyone, but I'd say 90 to 95% of people, even the people who probably never thought anything about their life, when given a terminal diagnosis, start trying to do that deep work. So I can promise you... <laughs> It's so much better to do that, to come to the point where someone says, I hate to tell you, I'm sorry, the cancer has spread, you're dying. And you've been spending your whole life doing that work. There's just, it's so much more peaceful. Uh, it's the only way I can say it. It's just so much more peaceful. There's so fewer regrets. Your legacy is so much more better built and durable if you do that work from day one. Oh, yes, yes. I'm trying to yell off the mic so I don't get the whole peek out <laughs> thing. And we, we didn't go through the, the five top five regrets of dying. And you had cited this in your book from another book, I believe, that had, that had come out in 2012. Is that right? Bronny Ware, The Five Regrets of the Dying. So I just wanted to read these out for folks uh, because I didn't expect you to come on here and have these memorized. But just, just to read them out, just given what we're talking about. So one was... I wish I had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life others expected of me. We talked about that. I wish I hadn't worked so hard. And, and it's interesting because some of us use work as a means to not do the work that we actually need to do. <laughs> I wish I had the courage to express my feelings, something that plagues a lot of us, but men in particular. Yes. Yes. It's just, I mean, it is, it's, even now when I interact with folks from different generations and I see the communication styles or the inability to just simply share how one's, how one feels and how that comes out. And then we talk about compounding, how not being able to express how you feel then could impact your children and then impact just, then they see that and then they don't know how to express how, how they feel. So just a really impactful thing for, I wish I had stayed in touch with my friends. I've also heard things about men tending to die l more lonely or tend tending to be more lonely than women. Is I, I see you nodding. Can, so is there, is there. Yeah. You know, men for whatever reason, don't form the same types of social bonds that women do. And of course this is not everyone, but I think as a group, uh, men tend to be loners. I, I hate to draw this picture, but you see this so often. Men tend to retire, sit on the couch and watch TV or go play golf. And that's about it. And they tend to eventually isolate themselves. Women have much more stronger social bonds. And in fact, it's very common. I see this just even in retirees, not people who are dying, but retirees where the women are out living a great life at 70 and the men are just sitting there watching TV and grumbling. And so we see this a lot. And I think the social bonds have something to do with that. It makes sense. I think about when, when someone, an older family member tells me like, oh, I was just out with so-and-so. And, and with the men, it's funny, like, I never talk to the men on the phone, these family members, but they usually are on the couch. And whoever, whatever woman I'm talking to has just come back from her out with her girls, her golden girl. Yep, exactly. <laughs> totally, totally. And then uh, number five on, on the list, top five regrets of the dying. I wish that I had let myself be happier. Now that, that, that word happier, it, it, it can be a charged word. It can mean a lot of different things. How do you think about that happy piece? Right. So the word happy is a charged word. And I, I don't love thinking about happy as much because I think it's an emotion that comes and goes and sometimes it's somewhat chemical. Um, but I do think about this idea of contentedness. So I would substitute the word content versus happy, but same idea. So for me, there are two keys that I found to at least building my life to be happy and I think could help other people. Um, the first key is building a life of purpose in which you find yourself having these series of climbs, these things that you're working on that have deep meaning to you that A, feel like regardless of the outcome, feel exciting and interesting, the process of doing them is exciting, and B, that you feel like you can make some small incremental gain in. So I talk about podcasting a lot when I talk about this concept. 
I love this idea again of having a million downloads a month in my podcast. I'm nowhere, nowhere, nowhere near that. But again, that's something I can't control. But podcasting is part of my purpose because I know when I get behind the mic and start talking and have a conversation with someone, I always come out of that conversation happy, right? So the process of doing this thing fills me up. So this is part of what contentedness looks like to me is filling my time with things like this. And I do know that I can incrementally improve on it. So I might not get a million new listeners a month, but maybe I can get a few extra. Maybe I can tighten up my interviews. Maybe I can get more interesting people on. Maybe I can do a better community segment in the podcast. Like I can think of all these little things I can do to incrementally improve. And so what contentedness is, is building up as many of these climbs or spending your time on them as possible in place of things you don't like doing. And so that's what I feel is, is happiness or contentedness. The other thing about happiness is a little bit more different. I think to be happy in the future, you have to come to terms with your past. So to me, happiness is telling myself the story, telling myself the stories about my past that are magical, right? So I think we can interpret our lives in many ways, but I found that when I come to peace with what happened in my past and look at it more like a hero's journey, I tend to be much more optimistic and excited about tomorrow. And so if you think about it, people who felt like victims in their past are rarely happy. And people who are continuously telling you about their hardships and why it was meaningful to them and led them to a better place generally have happy futures. Those are happy people. Um, so those are the two things, right? Building a series of purposeful climbs and retelling the stories of my life to make them magical, my past. Those two things put together have given me probably the sunniest disposition I think that I've ever had for my future. Taking stock, a hospice doctor's advice on financial independence, building wealth, and living a regret-free life. Jordan, I really appreciate you coming on the podcast, sharing everything that you have today. And I, I think just from what you've shared, people, sh it should be clear to people that this is so much more than a personal finance book. As always, Rich, it is a pleasure to be on your show. And yes, this book was meant to be about how to build a good life, maybe through the lens of personal finances, but really about how to live a life that feels good for us. And where can everyone find the book? What are all the places? Is it the Amazon, the the Noble, the... The easiest place actually to learn about everything I do, including the book, is to go to jordangrummet.com. That's J-O-R-D-A-N-G-R-U-M-E-T.com. There you can see, of course, a way to purchase the book and learn about it. But also the three ways that I have or do create content are there. I had a medical blog, which I blogged from about 2004 to 2018. The link is there, as well as my financial blog, diversify.com. And finally, my podcast, the Earn and Invest podcast, jordangrummet.com. Easiest way to get to all of them. Love it. And I, I want to say seeing and hearing this and seeing your rise and seeing your continued growth, it's kind of proof of what we're talking about, where you mentioned turning 50 and just the level of clarity, the things that you're still doing. And what particularly hit me is hearing that just how long you've been from 2000 writing since what you say, 2004. Yep. It's just like how long You've been at it and it took some time to finally say, you know what, this is what I want to do. These are the areas that I want to focus on, but you got there. You got I there. Would tell, so, yeah. yeah. I, I would tell people, obviously my life is not perfect, right? There are right. things I don't like doing. I mean, I have hardships just like everyone else, but doing this work has probably put me in the happiest place that I've ever been. And it's been a concerted long-term happiness. And that was just something I continuously struggled with up until I started thinking about these issues. Yes, Jordan, thank you so much for dropping the gems on them. <laughs> thank you for having me.